We should be live. Also, um, if you have the Twitch page up, I always mess this up myself. Make sure to mute the Twitch page. Otherwise, yeah. you'll hear us both twice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> cool. Yeah. So we, sh we should be live. Uh, we'll give people a few more minutes uh, to come in. And I just tweeted from the Planet Scale account. Okay. Um, so it should come through in a second. Then you can uh, retweet and share that if you would like. Perfect. I'm going to share this internally as well. It's still, I don't see it on the plant scale page yet, but. Um, it, for some reason, it's like, I've never seen this before, but there's like a loading icon on Twitter that it was oh, taking yeah. like. <laughs> it is weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a lot of issues with Twitter today. Um, really? Did I retweet it? Yeah. A lot of, some people in my company had that issue too. So it's not just. Okay. Here. Okay. I just retweet it. Let's do it. Cool. Nice. Form starter kit. Cool. I'm gonna share this in our marketing channel. Other two. It's funny how many like little things go into streaming, like just getting I know. the the share stuff, all the <laughs> settings and stuff set. But it's yeah. a fun. Like I, I mentioned, I'm kind of burnt out on virtual stuff, virtual conference presentations, I think specifically because I can't, I don't get as much interaction. So I love live streams because I can actually at least like see people responding to yeah. the stuff that I'm doing. So I feel like that makes a big difference. Definitely. This Versus one of live stream. So it's going to be, I'm excited. <laughs> this is, what, did you say this is your first one? One of my first, I think, nice. yeah, I've never done like a proper live stream. Life. I've done oh, cool. like this, but this is nice. Me. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I I've done a lot at this point. I started like right when I started at all zero, um, I had heard about people live streaming and I was just like, I'll give it a shot. And that was back in early 2020, right when COVID hit. So then live streaming became super, super common and more and more people were doing it. So yeah. since then I've done a ton of live streams. It's just kind of become like a de facto way to, to interact. But the, like just having, having people have the ability to respond or like send stuff in in messages um yeah. and chat makes a big difference because otherwise i'm just sitting here and i have no idea if they care <laughs> i know it's it's a very more it's definitely synchronous versus asynchronous so mm -hmm. off, synchronous is great for real-time feedback and people who are generally curious and, and asking questions getting feedback right away it's good it's amazing mm -hmm. i'm gonna share this in our um probably growth channel uh, Live. I can't believe um, for people that are joining, we were talking about the growth of Vercel and being over 200 employees is yeah. so wild. Um, and I think you said when you joined seven months ago, it was like 80 people. Yeah. That's it's so been wild. A crazy ride so far. Um, yeah. When I joined, I was, I was employee 81, I think. Mm -hmm. And then tripled our hit count. <laughs> In less than seven in like months. months, yeah, yeah, it's it's nuts. I think that's I think our my manager Lee he wrote an article on hypergrowth. It's mm -hmm. very important for this. It's like how do you uh, thrive in a company that's growing so fast and like what are the? It's like very different than if you're working in like a I don't know like a fan company mm -hmm. or or a smaller small scale company and like it's a different sort of culture that you need to adapt and evolve with. So yeah, it's a lot of things to learn. Yeah. How do you write an article? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me see if I can find that, actually. Is that on his personal? It's um, on the hyper bio. Yeah, hypergrowth. Sweet. Yeah, let me throw that link in the chat for people that want to cool. um, read that, too. And that's the kind of, we were talking about this a little bit before we went live. Like, that's kind of what I was looking for in joining Planet Scale was, like, just being earlier on with a younger company and being a part of that, like, um, that initial, like, kind of boom in growth and the things we can do and support and the impact that we can make. I feel like at a smaller company, it, there's more opportunity to make bigger impacts with the stuff mm -hmm. that you do. Totally. Totally. It's just a different sort of ball game. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, I think it's great for, for people who are like, we can also talk about like the early stage career stuff uh, in a bit, but, uh, but yeah, it's great for early stage career folks and the people mm -hmm. who are, trying to learn as much as possible. Um, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I can, I can see that from 
because you're just forced to learn so much. Like that's kind of, if you, if you were to join a bigger company, you could be kind of isolated with what you do and you probably would learn that individual thing like deeper, right? Like you'd spend more time on that individual thing and go deeper in that thing. Uh, but at a smaller company, you're pro like, you're probably bouncing around and getting exposed to a lot of different stuff. That's one of the things for me that um, I talked about in my interviews at Planet Scale was I want to, I want to do my job, but I also want to hear more about what's going on around me from different people with different roles because it's a smaller team and like, you can't help but kind of take in just like at least just hearing about what's going on. And eventually the more you hear about it, the more that turns into like knowledge that you can apply yourself. hundred percent. I think it really shapes you into this all around the holistic uh, professional uh, because by working in a smaller team, you got to be able to own a lot of different parts of the product. Right. And, and mm -hmm. not just like, Oh, I'm just focusing on this feature for the next 10 months, but instead okay. you're working with multiple like different functional groups to be able to coordinate the launch, the, the, the development, the production and the launch of the an actual feature or an actual product. And I think for me personally, I do want to start my own company in the future. So this is a great sort of learning experience that will equip me with the skills to be able to become mm -hmm. a good founder in the future. So, yeah. That's another thing that I talked about too, was learning uh, about the growth of like what things factor into the growth of a company and what things are companies doing early on to be successful longer term for the exact same reason. Like I definitely at some point could see myself investing time and building a SaaS product of some sort. I have no idea what it would be, um, but having more experience at an earlier stage company, I think only helps kind of um, I don't know, motivate in some ways, but also just like teach you some of the things that would be helpful once you get there. 100%. I think I got, we got a comment from Theo, one of, one of my good mm -hmm. friends, Twitter. I actually met him in person. Oh, he's, nice. Uh, I met him at the, Founders Inc. House. Uh, very recently, he, he's saying that if he moves ping to platform startup cable, <laughs> will we start using it for streams? Definitely, definitely. It would be interesting to see because I think what ping is, it's uh, it's a live stream product. So something that uses the platform's model where it's multi-tenant and also does live stream will be really interesting to see. So Theo, if you ever do that, let me know. Happy to feature it. <laughs> I love it. That's one of the, by the way, uh, Lee Rob's in the chat hanging out. What's up, Lee? Um, I think that's one of the coolest parts for me being in DevRel is I get to be connected to so many different people and then also learn more about their products and kind of integration uh, points between the different products. That's so, so fun to me um, because that just like thinking about building a SaaS or something, I feel like I'm more enabled to understand what the different pieces are that are out there that I could use and leverage to build something myself one day yeah. or just like fun content in the meantime. 100%. That's the best part about serverless, like the whole serverless ecosystem where you get to integrate with all of these different mm -hmm. tools that are really, really good at what they do. Um, and to be able to form this partnership, this ecosystem of players, that's ex actually what I'm going to be fo focusing on moving forward at Vercel, going to be the DevRel for ecosystems, which is basically oh, cool. yeah. partners that we have and use that to build more startup kits, more, you know, help empower our enterprise customers more. Um, so yeah, it's going to be, I'm very, very excited about that. Cool. I love that. So we'll probably have more reason to talk in the future. <laughs> um, so we've got a couple of people hanging out with us. We can probably kind of like kick off the formal topic. Uh, first off, um, I always forget to do this, but um, for people who may not know who I am, my name is James Quick. I'm a staff developer advocate at PlanetScale. And I've got with me as a guest, Steven from Vercel to talk about the platform starter kit. Uh, do you want to give an introduction to yourself, what you do? And then uh, we mentioned kind of talked a little bit about like early uh, early career opportunities with you joining at uh, joining at Vercel. Um, anyway, just a little bit about uh, you and your background. For sure. Uh, my name is Steven. Hey, everyone. My name is Steven. I am a developer advocate at Vercel, focusing on ecosystems and building products and integrating of with all our partners, such as PlanetScale. Um, and personally, I joined Vercel about seven months ago. Um, it was Vercel was my first like full time job after college, which is a very big deal for folks like me. And there's also one of my friends on the team, Hassan, is also um, in the same boat as I am. And I think it's a great place to be because it's a company that's going through hyper growth. And we're adding a lot of talented folks, uh, people who are who have like tons of experience, 20 plus years of experience in this industry. And getting to learn and work with these individuals is just, um, it's a hyper growth for me, myself as a career uh, as well. So I'm just blessed to be here. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm like, I'm jealous for you. Like, I think that's such a cool place to start. And the idea of like, 
a hyper growth for you. Um, even though I've been in the tech industry for a while now, the last like working at Aussie before this and now at Planet Scale has given me the ability to learn much more about areas that I didn't know much about before. So like all zero authentication, authorization, all the things that go into that, like those two years was kind of like a deep dive to build out this like knowledge base that I really had no, idea. like I knew nothing almost about it. And then other than like basic SQL queries and like using databases to build apps, I didn't know anything about databases. So I'm like going through, I've got a learning my SQL book that's like 600 pages long. And I've got on my calendar every day, like a 30 minute study session because there's just so much, right? So it's kind of fun for me, I think, to look at like different areas of tech and invest really heavy in them every couple of years or so. And then like after a while, I'm starting to become like much more well-rounded as a developer. Definitely. I think that's the same situation that I have here. I, I'm learning so much about RDS scores, which is like real, real experience scores and how to build the most SEO optimized website. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's an incredible learning experience. Yeah, there's a lot of, I feel like being at Vercel, there's a lot of different factors or a lot of different like areas to be involved in. There's like frameworks that you can use to build applications. There's tons of different database options, headless CMS options. There's tons of different, you mentioned like being in serverless, it's kind of like integrating these different SaaS platforms, right? Like Stripe and Cloudinary and all the different, all zero, like all the different things that you could do. So I feel like you have a great opportunity too to get like, deep experiences in some things, but also a pretty wide array of experiences, especially doing integrations at Vercel. Yeah, it's, it's a balance between going too wide and also going mm -hmm. to a depth. There has to be a balance there because you people you, you want to be uh, a good in between between uh, being a jack of all trades and a master of none versus yep. being actually specializing in, 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 in a, only one thing. Exactly. Yeah. And pilot that really uh, so yeah, here at Resell, we get to do that a lot, uh, especially as DevRels. You get to build starter kits, you get to do live streams, talk to people, and understand what the users' pain points are. So yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. Sweet. Um, well, do you want to kick off the conversation about the platform starter kit specifically? Like what was what is the platform starter kit? Maybe what was the idea behind it? Like what's what's the point of it? What is it trying to enable for people that are looking to build applications? Sure. So the platform starter kit, the inspiration behind that starter kit came from, we've seen a huge influx of folks who are building multi-tenant applications, uh, whether it's a blogging platform for you to create your own blogs, or it's a website builder, or it's something that some, I, I call it a B2B2C B2, B2, B2 products, which is essentially um, one of the main examples that we have is in status. They are building a uptime tracking page and they sell to businesses that serve this page to consumers. Um, so those are a few main examples of what a, like a multi-tenant application is. And traditionally, if you're building a platform like that uh, without using Vercel and XJS, it's a lot of work when it comes to setting up NG, pro, NGINX proxies, getting the SSL to work out of the box. So it's a lot of like configuration and setup, but um, with the, the, and that sort of inspired us to build a starter kit that allows you to do that really, really easily. And the funny thing is I've been telling this to a few folks already, but um, given that I've been working on this, this is like literally the project that I was hired at Vercel to build. Oh, and nice. I've been working on this for about seven months now, and I'm very, very deep into the weeds. I, I sometimes take for granted how easy it is to set up <laughs> a multi-tenant application with Next.js, literally three to four lines of code that are, that does like the um, handles the, you know, the rewrites, uh, I can go deeper into that later, but three to four lines of code and you're done. You don't need to worry about SSL. You don't need to worry about setting up NGINX proxy. Um, so yeah, that's, that's our goal. We set out to create this framework and create this template that allows people to create their own businesses on top of Rosal, uh, in a very easy way and basically accelerate their growth. Yeah. I love that. And it's like, I've wondered how multi-tenant domain applications work, like how that stuff gets set up. And I would have imagined, and you kind of alluded to it outside of Next and Vercel, but that's really tricky stuff. Like I, I just, I'm kind of, I'm kind of still overwhelmed at thinking about how that would be put together. So to have like a starter kit that already has it together and there's kind of good to go is pretty like, pretty amazing, I think. Yeah, that that's, personally, when I was building this, I, I realized like, right from the start that the Next.js uh, framework is already very powerful in itself. And what I was doing on top of that was just, you know, 
patching around like some of the functions that we already have, the rewrites. And, and recently we roll out edge functions. Mm -hmm. And today we roll out uh, on demand ISR. I'm gonna talk about that later. It's very, very exciting. Uh, so all these different features, just putting them together and building this super powerful application that will allow you to do multi-tenant, uh, multi-tenancy, uh, globally accessible, high uh, RES scores, and making sure that all your users are able to serve that content really, really uh, efficiently and, and accessible all across the world. So yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you, I think you almost kind of touched on this. Um, so you had a big announcement go out in email and social media and stuff today about uh, Next.js 12.1 with a couple of different features uh, that yep. were launched. And Lee actually teased it yesterday, I think, on Twitter is saying, we're going to launch one of the most requested features that uh, people have been looking for. What do you think it is? And I, I was like, I don't know, but I'm sure it's really cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you want to do a, like a quick shout out for a couple of the features that were released today? For sure, yeah. That was a very, like honestly, a smart uh, tweet that Lee mm -hmm. did. Like, inadvertently, we got a ton of um, you know user feedback on what exactly do they want. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, the, the, the main feature that we released today was on-demand ISR. And to understand what that is, we need to go back to what ISR is. So incremental static regeneration is a way for you to add, like, update your static sites after build time. So in the past, when you're building a static site, you can't really update the content if you didn't push another build to prod. So you have to like push another build, which usually takes a lot of time and bandwidth. But with ISR, all you need to do is set a revalidate time frame. So if you set for 60 seconds, all requests to that site or to that page within the 60 second, 60 second time frame, um, they will be served the same content. And any subsequent requests outside of the time frame will be served the freshest uh, results from the database. So it will do a revalidate, rebuild the whole page, and then serve the content to the next user. However, that wasn't enough because with that, um, that would be one downside of that is it will basically take a lot of build time because no matter how many, how much like um, traffic you're getting, it will get it will the page will be revalidated every sixty seconds mm -hmm. at most, and that's not very efficient if the page is not updated, you know, very often. So what we want, like what our community has been asking for for the longest time is the ability to invalidate the cache on demand. So if there's a change in the database, you can set up a webhook listener, or if you're doing like directly, you know, if you have a function that can trigger that uh, revalidate function, it will allow you to basically invalidate the page uh, globally, uh, basically whenever you need. So that's basically what we launched today, the ability to do that. And I actually just, integrated that into the platform starter kit, which means that every time you hit publish, you invalidate the cache for that page itself. And uh, the when we launched the platform starter kit, this wasn't, a, uh, this wasn't live yet, this feature wasn't live. And there was this little bug where when you publish, like when you publish a new page and then you go to the homepage of the, of the blog, the new post is not there yet because the cache is mm -hmm. not invalidated. But with this, it shows up instantly when you go back to the homepage, so. It's very, very exciting. It's been a feature that I've been like asking for <laughs> myself and a lot of people have been asking for for the longest time. So very excited for this. Yeah. So um, I I still have yet to use incremental static regeneration, although I have a fairly good idea of what it is. And like part of the big benefit is if I have a huge website with a thousand or a hundred thousand pages or something, the traditional way before this is like all of those static pages get built at build time, which takes forever. And you could have like one of the things I saw was like, if you did X number of milliseconds per page, then it's an hour build time, which is ridiculous. And I already, um, I'm working on migrating my, my personal site to next. So I think this will get better anyway, but the builds take way too long. And I like, it's like annoyingly long. So I'm excited to kind of try that out with my site once I get there. Um, but this way you could like choose, Hey, go ahead and pre-build these a thousand pages that are the most common, uh, mm -hmm. for example. And then um, use the the sixty second window or whatever that time frame is to do like uh, the next time a request comes in for this page that's not already cached, go ahead and build it, and then it will cache it for a subsequent request that comes in. And now you're saying that I can call a webhook that will invalidate the cache. Is that per specific page or is that per the site as a whole? You can do page like it's it's all route specific, so you get okay. a specify exactly which route yeah. you want to invalidate. So for example, in my case, if I'm invalid, if I'm like 
publishing a new post or if I'm editing a, an existing post, I will have to invalidate the route for the post itself as well as the homepage because the post shows up in homepage. So we're gonna do two invalidations. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that works. Okay. I can I can dive into the code in a bit or or show a demo video of how it works. I, I just tweeted about it actually. Nice. Do you, wait, I can um, share that. So that tweet has like um, clear before and after difference of uh, of this of this feature on the Mana ISR. Cool. Do you? Can um, I share? I'll share it to you here in the chat, but you can paste it. Sweet. Maybe. I'll grab that and I will throw it in the so chat. Like Twitter has been adding these like query params at the back. Like I try to delete them. <laughs> <laughs> It used to do just S20, but now it's like T equals to some random hash. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what those are for. Probably like UTM tracking. I don't know. <laughs> it's yeah. interesting. Anyway, so yeah, that's basically the, the the killer feature that people have been asking for. And we're so excited that it's finally live. Sweet. Um, so the other part of this, and this was like, I guess it was when Next.js 12 was released, was uh, edge functions and mm -hmm. middleware. And I actually, I didn't quite understand the implications of the edge for a while. And someone um, had a, um, I posted about it. And several people gave me responses. Then I had a conversation with someone in DMs on Twitter about it. And it finally like clicked what like the edge was versus just like your already existing serverless functions um, in Vercel and other platforms that you could use. Uh, so what are, like, what are edge functions in Vercel and middleware and how do they potentially factor into some of the stuff we'll talk about today? Yeah, so edge functions are, we're actually like shifting over more towards edge functions because of the fact that it's 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 global and it's really really fast. There's no like cold boot time compared to serverless functions. So uh, the easiest way to understand is is like if you're requesting a content from say um, from a website and usually that triggers a serverless function that calls a database in like I don't know it happens like US East Virginia or something so that uh, takes much longer because there's a boot like it's using lambda under the hood uh -huh. AWS lambda and that has a cold boot time whereas with edge functions it uses call flow workers and it's basically really, really fast um, and allows you to access content all across the world because there's like different edge nodes um, that are scattered all across the globe. And the cool part about edge functions and why it's better than serverless functions, it allows you to do a lot of personalization and uh, server-side logic at the edge. Mm -hmm. but, and a great example of this is A-B testing. So if you want to do A-B testing between two different versions of a page, and instead of doing it on the client side, which is what usually what people do, they have, okay, if this user comes, depending on what demographic they are, and they'll assign you with a tag and assign you a cookie, and that changes the page. That causes layout shift because like you're doing on the client side, some of the pages, the components might have a different dimension. Whereas if you're doing it on the server side, you're serving an entirely different version of the page, which means that there's no layout shift and it all happens instantly. It's like, there's no latency at all. So it's like really, really fast response times and in this case, how that ties into the platform starter kit is we're using edge functions to do rewrites. And rewrites is basically a way to detect what the incoming host name is. Uh, so for example, if I'm requesting demo.versal.pub, demo.versal.pub is the host name. Uh, and it will take that host name, determine if it's a subdomain or if it's a custom domain, and then it rewrites that to a dynamic route, which is a feature in Next.js where you can do dynamic routes and then under the dynamic route, you serve a static page. So I can, I can, I think it's easier if we go into the code for this, but that's basically what we're using. We're using edge functions to rewrite uh, and it all happens instantly because it's really fast. You just can't follow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love, I love that. And the, I think the key differentiator for me was I was kind of thinking about serverless functions originally as being serverless and thinking they were replicated across the world, but that's not necessarily the case. Like when you, create a project in Vercel. If you have static pages, those are on the CDN, so those are replicated all across the world, but your serverless functions actually live in a specific data center. For me, it would probably be US East and Virginia or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then these uh, these edge functions now, they run in not complete node, so they run in uh, V8 engine, not node itself, which means they can run anywhere. So like those functions get replicated now all across the world, which means if I'm in the US, and I request it, it's going to come from US East. If I'm in Japan, it's going to come from whatever the closest data center is there. 
And then you mentioned the startup time of being in that V8 engine versus like full node engine. The startup cost is like negligible as compared to like Lambda is getting much, much faster, but still like something. Yeah. Um, so that speed now, I think the idea kind of is as much as you could bake into the edge functions and still be productive with your application, the better the experience is going to be because it's going to be that much faster all the way around. 100%, 100%. And if you think about like going back to the conversation of on-demand ISR, if you couple that with this, it basically helps a lot of our clients save um, serverless execution time because instead mm -hmm. of revalidating the page every 60 seconds, they only have to revalidate if the user makes a change to their database. If they're using Notion, if they're using Planet Scale, whatever, it changes only when there's a change um, in the back end. So it's very it's very cost efficient. Mm -hmm. And with edge functions, it becomes very time efficient and, and, and uh, gives very, very good RES scores. Cool. Um, yeah, this is this goes back to the conversation about like so many different potentially things or potential topics and deep dives to get into that you now are like have the experience of tying all together. Um, do you want to share? You mentioned kind of showing a little bit of that in the code. Do you want to share your screen and take a look at some of the code snippets? Sure, let's do it. So I'm just gonna share it code that's on GitHub. I think that'll be easier. Um, I can grab. This is the slash platforms. Yes. On GitHub, cool. I'll throw that link in the chat for people if they want to check that out as well. And then I'll go ahead and bring up your yes. screen. So yes. I see I see your screen on uh, the stream that we're on now. And then if you go to a different tab. Mm -hmm. Is it still the same? Um, I still see the, the, the screen with us in it. Yeah, there's a weird, I think there's something wrong with my Chrome where it just keeps sharing the same <laughs> thing. Um, let me try something. Okay. <laughs> so I could do GitHub platforms and try this. Okay, does this work? Let's see. Bring that in. Um, cool. So I see the GitHub repo. Perfect. Sweet. Okay. Sure. So this is. Um, I'm basically going to show you how exactly it works um, with platforms and uh, the edge functions rewrite. So what the, the like all of these, this is a very complete starter kit. So it shows a lot of different features. Like you can do static tweets, you can do custom images with culinary and stuff like that. But the key part when it comes to multi-tenant applications is you basically got to set up a middleware file under your pages folder. And within that middleware file, we'll detect what the host name is. Um, so in this case, we're taking the URL, we're getting the path name. Um, this we're going to use that for later, but basically we're going to get what the host name is. So in this case, it could be, you know, demo the result pub. It could be platformize.co, which is the custom domain example that we have for this. So when we get the host name, we'll basically you know, ignore this, but we're determining if it's, if it's, a if it's a custom domain or if it's, um, a, a subdomain. Uh, and basically what I'm doing is I'm just replacing .versal.pub, which is the root URL for this application. Um, ignore this. Um, and then I'm basically rewriting this custom, uh, the current host variable to a dynamic route under the underscore sites folder. And uh, if this is a little confusing, let's check out what the underscore sites folder is. So this is, um, it's a folder and under that folder, there's a dynamic route. And that dynamic route basically has an index file and also a Slack file, which is for the blog posts. So within the index file, we basically rewrote the host name. So here you can see there's a parameter, the site parameter, and that site could be a subdomain or it could be a custom domain. So uh, the, re like, th the way we're determining this is because we, we replaced the dot versal dot pub slug uh, with uh, we basically got rid of that so it can either be demo or it could be the custom domain which is platformize.co so and then after that we're basically using prisma to get the data for this particular site and we're uh, we're feeding that to the client site and uh, it gets generated on at build time or on validate so that's basically it it's actually very simple we have a very very it's another example uh, that shows this, um, yeah, this is the one. 
So under edge functions, we have a host name rewrites example. That's very, very simple. Uh, you can see here, it's literally just, uh, if you want something that's more clear and doesn't have all these extra features, <laughs> try out this one. So it basically shows this, 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 and a custom domain that maps to subdomain one and everything is uh, statically generated. So it's really, really fast. Um, so yeah, this is another, I'm going to send it in the chat as well, but this is another example you can refer to. Uh, but yeah, so the, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I don't want to keep rambling. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. And by the way, if people have questions about this, uh, make sure to throw those in the chat too. Um, Octal Pixel asked if there will be a, a video on demand of this after the stream. It'll be available on Twitch, I think, for 14 days by default. And then I will probably copy this over to the Planet Scale YouTube channel as well. Um, so in in the the get static prop, so on that um, in that dynamic route, mm -hmm. we are looking at so inside of the params that come from get static yep. props, there's the site param. So where does that one like what does that one actually relate to the domain that we're currently on? Yeah, let me show you this article that we wrote. It's a guide. We have a nice little diagram in there. So in here, I basically explain it, how the application structure looks like. So we have this folder, underscore sites, and then within that dynamic route. And the reason I did this uh, is because we don't want people to be able to access something like demo dot, uh, I don't know, like platformize. Oh, and then we don't want people to be, oops. We don't want people to be able to ex uh, access the, uh, the, for example, if that's Steven or like demo, and we would want them to be able to see the other site. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So for example, if I go to demo the pub, and if I type in slash Steven, it should give me a 404, which makes sense. But if I didn't do, uh, where is it? If I didn't do underscore sites, it will rewrite to whatever dynamic route it is, and it might show the content that I have under Steven. Oh, under a different pub. Okay. So it's a totally different content. So that's basically what oh, we cool. did to, to circumvent that and prevent that from happening. So, okay, going back to the rewrite, we're basically rewriting it to a dynamic route, underscore sites, and then site. And then within that, there's an index, uh, there's an index file, which is the main page right here. And then there's the slug dynamic route, which is for each and every one of the blog posts. Oops, this is not one. But each and every one of the blog posts that we have. Cool. And um, you mentioned like blog being a common example. A really good one that I think you referred to in the documentation is Hashnode as an example. Mm -hmm. So you can have your own blog on Hashnode. You can yeah. also, uh, which it, I think becomes like Hashnode.com slash your name. Or no, maybe it's your name dot hashnode.com. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. And then you can also have your own custom domain for, yeah, you got that there with Catalan. Exactly. Um, you can also have like Hashnode be hosted under your, or your site be shown under your own custom domain and it's still exactly. using Hashnode. Exactly. So you get to have your own branding, your own domain. And uh, we Hashnode actually just implemented on demand ISR. So hmm. uh, they're able to, like with that, they'll be able to cut their bill by a significant amount. And uh, yeah, it's very exciting. So we're, we're helping folks like Hashnode uh, folk, like, folks like Mirror, which is like a Web3 publishing platform, um, and Rate TV, which is a, they're like a LinkedIn, but much more organic. And like, people really love how beautifully it's designed. Super is a, is a web, website builder. Type Dream makes with all three of them are website builders. Super is one that integrates with Notion, which we can talk about later. And then there's the B2B2C platforms, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you actually want to, do you want to open up the super site and just mention what that is now? Cause this is like really, there's so many tools I get kind of overwhelmed cause I, I do uh, my YouTube channel and I get a lot of people reaching out asking if I want to do a video about their product and stuff, which I wish I had the time to do all of them. Cause there's so many amazing ones and I get overwhelmed by it. Oh, but yeah. I just saw this today and the idea, like I know people have used started to use with the notion API, like notion as a headless CMS basically pulling their data to their site and they can build their own next uh, next application or whatever. Uh, yeah. But this one is a visual builder that's tied to Notion to actually build your sites um, all within that builder, right? 
Super is really cool. They basically this they even give like the landing page that is built in Notion. So this is their Notion page. They basically just connected this to Super and added a few like custom styles here and there. And that's basically it. That's just the site that they have. It looks very clean, has really, really good RDS scores. And uh, yeah, it's very, very performant. And so uh, cool. can show like exactly how it works. It's like basically create a site, test, and then I don't know, you connect like a Notion URL. I don't really have one, but uh, <laughs> you basically connect the Notion URL. I'm going to connect there actually. Um, and then uh, test site and oops. Anyways, so <laughs> you a Notion page, you can yep. connect that. Um, basically, get a template or something, and then it will basically allow you to create a very performance site uh, very, very quickly. And all of this are it's using Next.js, so it's really fast. As you can see, um, and yeah, it works with all the different domains that they have. Uh, and users can connect their own domains. They can use a builder to do drag and drop, which is really, really cool. Um, so yeah, we basically, the, the, the reason why we created a starter kit is to provide them with the building blocks that they need to get started. And if they have any more features, like if they want to integrate Slate as an editor for text, uh, rich text editing, they can do that. We actually added a, a Slate example recently. Um, I think it's for I am. Demo the first cell that I am. It's really, really cool. Uh, whoops, <laughs> it's broken. Uh, <laughs> this is another uh, another one that I hadn't heard of, by the way. I hadn't. I've never used Slate before, but it's like a. You said it's like a. I'm got the GitHub repo that I can put it in here, but it's a rich text editor that you can throw into React specifically. It looks like. Exactly. So let me just show exactly how it works. So we can go in there, create a new post, uh, post title, description. And then you can do which one, and uh, it's very customizable. So you can do my content here dot dot, and then you can do H two subheading, um, blah, blah, blah. And you can even do like bold italic. Nice. You can create. Yeah, this is like it was built by one of our very talented solutions engineers. His name is Guillermo, I think. Um, okay. Uh, he built this, and it's really cool. Oh, and that's it, cool. Oops. Uh, I, just, I feel like we're in a world where it's so accessible to learn the skills and the tools to build really cool stuff. I feel like all of these are really good examples of that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think Slate is very, very customizable, um, and it's powerful for people who are building uh, blogging platforms, so, mm -hmm. you know, like builders and stuff like that. I think what Super is doing with the drag and drop feature is also really cool. Um, there are a bunch of like libraries out there for you to do that. That's like React draggable, mm -hmm. um, etc. And I recently learned about this really cool one. I think it's um, Framer uh, Reorder. This is like allows you to do stuff like you can reorder. Uh, it takes a while for this. Like you can do this reordering. Mm -hmm. Really cool. So yeah, a lot of these libraries are already out there. So people sometimes have this incorrect uh, notion that. Not pun intended. Notion, yeah. I was going to call that out too. Nice. Yeah, people have this incorrect notion that, oh, it's actually so hard. How did they build it? Did they build it from scratch? Yep. But a lot of these platforms out there, they actually leverage existing libraries, most of them open source, for you to be able to build really high quality, world class user experiences. Um, so, yeah, my advice would be to not be intimidated and mm -hmm. to actually leverage what is already out there uh, to help you build all these different applications. But yeah, if you want something that's super simple and you don't want to code, you just want to use Notion, highly recommend Super. Um, they're probably the best Notion to website builder out there right now. Nice. Okay. Sure. I love it. Um, um, yeah, I've got a couple more questions, which may not need visual stuff. So we can just talk for now. And then if we need to, we can go, go back. Um, sounds good. Thinking about the different components or different like other services that are integrated here. One is Planet Scale. Um, so, in um, inside of this project, it's using Prisma, which if people have not heard of Prisma, it's an ORM object relational mapping uh, specifically for JavaScript and TypeScript, uh, and that basically just becomes an abstraction layer on top of your database. Uh, it happens to support uh, MySQL and Planet Scale, which is awesome. So we. Uh, use Prisma a lot in our documentation. Our new Next.js starter actually uses Prisma and Next.js awesome. and uh, is really cool. So 
what was were there any like specific benefits or things that uh, were interesting in terms of using planet scale for uh, the data behind the scenes of everything that's going on here yeah planet scale was a like a no-brainer like in terms of what uh, but interestingly enough the first when i first started building this the v1 the v0 of this i actually started using railway because at the time uh, there wasn't enough like documentation on how to like under like properly set up the servers not servers but like the connecting to the main database and stuff like that mm -hmm. so i started with railway but i eventually ran into this issue of uh connection limits so we mm -hmm. uh, with with serverless uh infrastructures you have this thing called a uh, database connection limit. So you every time someone creates a new account or someone accesses your site, that triggers a new connection to your database. Um, and with something like Railway or traditional, you know, backend services, they don't have pooling, which is a, a mechanism for you to group all the different connections together and only send one request to a database. So, but with Planet Scale. We were able to do that, so that's why eventually I switched over to Planet Scale. And using Prisma was also another no-brainer decision mm -hmm. there because it's type safe. It it it's in integrates with Prisma and sorry, integrates with Planet Scale and Vercel really seamlessly. And uh, yeah, it's just very very easy to set up and very powerful as well. Yeah, that works out. I mean, obviously so well for us, but it's good to hear that specific use case because that's something that we talk about a lot. Um, so in the serverless world, like you were saying. Um, your serverless functions, the Lambda functions are are spinning up and spinning down. So there's no like long-term uh, TCP connections that are maintained to the actual database, which is what you would have if you had a traditional like node application. It would just stay alive and it would maintain its connection. But now uh, in your, when you're in service, you're like creating them, losing them, creating them, losing them. And, and especially if you have like a very popular application, you're doing that all over the place and creating tons of different connections. And a lot of databases are just not able to support that. Um, so I think we like, we advertise like almost infinite depending on the tier that you're on for connections. But if you look at like the free tier, I think it's like a thousand connections or something. So you can have plenty of activity going yeah. on at the same time um, and be able to scale that up like really, really high just on the free tier, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, so it's great to hear that like, that was a specific use case that already made sense to you. And then same for, I, I would say, like all of us, the using Prisma is a no-brainer too. Like it's just, I, I've i taught boot camps before where we cover like databases and SQL and stuff. And that one of the first things I tell them is like, I'm, I'm not the best SQL person because we like most people use ORMs like all over the place, or at least a lot of people do. So it's it's yeah. almost rare that you write um, regular uh, regular raw SQL behind the scenes and much more common, at least in my experience, to use an ORM on top of that. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think with Planet Scale, uh, right from the beginning, it, it like another issue when it comes to building applications that we all want is reliability. And in the same way, Versal is really reliable for um, you know front end and, and serving content all across the globe. Planet Scale was very reliable when it comes to databases. There was no like there was not a single second that I worried that oh my Planet Scale database. <laughs> Or it's gonna crash or anything. Even when we had like tens of thousands of users mm -hmm. accessing the page for the demo uh, for platforms when we launched, so that was another key component as well. We wanted something that's super reliable, scalable, and um, basically powerful for for our applications. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's why I'm I'm like recommending this. I'm I'm built like I'm building a side project myself. It's called DAO Central. It's like a mm calling it the glass door for DAOs. For that, I'm also using Next.js, Prisma, Planet Scale, The whole thing, yeah. This is a very valuable stack. Personally, I like to, like, I, I love trying on new technologies, um, but when I find something that works... <laughs> you just like, stick with it. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's it's reliable, and it doesn't, like, I'm very familiar with it, and, and I think Planet Scale is one of the most reliable options that are out there. There's obviously other options that people choose as well, like this... Yep. We use Superbase. Some people use Notion itself as a database, but when it comes to building like raw, you know, um, SQL databases, MySQL databases, you guys have the best, uh, best in class technology. And I think uh, the whole story behind like Vitesse and how you mm -hmm. guys put that into like enterprise solution, is just yeah, it's just uh, amazing. <laughs> I will say the the more I've learned. Uh about Planet Scale as a whole, Vitesse specifically. So Vitesse is the underlying technology that Planet Scale is built on top of for everybody that's listening and may not know. 
the more I've learned, the more excited I've become about the product. And the more I've realized how many features Vitesse is already enabling for us, how many features Vitesse, um, how many features will be launched in the next couple of months, a little teaser there, uh, that have come from the power of Vitesse. And then I've just heard over and over again, like, here's something that Vitesse does that Planet Scale hasn't even like looked at getting to yet because there's so many other things that that we're doing that I just feel like it's going to it's going to be a game changer with all the different features like the the simplest example is the connection stuff for serverless so that's great then from a developer experience perspective the idea of branching and deploy requests and tying that into CI CD and DevOps and that sort of stuff is really really cool to me um so yeah the more I've learned and the more I've um just been around it and the conversation I hear the more excited I've been yeah, that's kind of like our relationship with Next.js. Like Next.js is a framework that started it all, and it's still like giving returns even after five years. That's been it's been uh, conceived. So um, I think that's sort of what we have with the the similar relationship we guys have with the test. And um, someone asked the question in the chat about how different connection pooling is with Prisma Data Proxy. I think Prisma Data Proxy is a way for you to view a database and make edits. Um, it's, I think they renamed it to Prisma Data Platform, if I'm not mistaken. But it's a way for you to view databases and be able to like make edits, sort, order, filter, and stuff like that. I don't think it's very similar to connection pooling because connection pooling is like uh, what you use to basically pull in all the different requests that are coming to a database and not overload your database with, with connection requests. So that's a, yeah, I hope that helps with that question. I don't know if you want to add anything, James, but... Yeah, I, I wanted to address it, but unfortunately, the answer that I have is not that great because I'm not that well versed on um, the Prisma data proxy. So there's an article in November 2021 um, that talks about the Prisma data proxy. I think uh, I was actually going to ask. Taylor just responded because Taylor had kind of worked with some of the stuff. Um, it does handle some of the connection management and will help with uh, pooling. I think part of the answer um, is that with since. Planet Scale already has support for connections at scale that you don't have to go that way. So I, and I'm guessing it's more useful for other databases that may not support that sort of stuff inherently. But I'm not 100% sure on that either, so don't quote me. That's actually one of the things that I should um, look into a little bit more. Um, I know Taylor, like I said, on our team has done a little bit of that. So um, maybe we'll have some more specific information on that in the future. But it's a great question. Um, so... I mentioned there was a couple of other technologies. Just kind of curious really quickly if you want to cover them briefly as we wrap up. Um, or maybe it was just one. Is it, no, two. Oh, yeah. No, just one. Um, sorry, what? Uh, what was the analogy? Oh, I, was, I thought we were going to talk about like culinary or something. Yes, culinary. culinary. Yeah, so um, this I was going back to like thinking there was more services that we needed to talk about. But uh, mm -hmm. culinary being... Image hosting, image optimization, image transformations, all that you can do like dynamically through the URL for your, uh, not just images, but uh, video as well. is It's really, really cool. People should go and check out Cloudinary if you haven't already. But yeah. how, how does Cloud, Cloudinary fit into uh, the starter kit? And then how does that relate to uh, like the next image component? How do those things work together? Yeah, so the it's funny. So... The first time I started playing around with culinary was actually when I was building my side project. I needed nice. a way for people to update, upload like cover pictures or logos for their DAOs or whatever. Um, and I started playing around with their, they had an upload widget that you can embed directly into your site. Uh, it took a bit of wrangling. I was trying to understand how we can do it on the client side without like, there were like some bugs that went because like Next.js has this issue where you cannot invoke window on client side like you got to put in the use effect anyway so to me i want to figure out but eventually figure out the code for that and i just like transported that and fitted it in, into the platform starter kit and it worked like a charm and it was just very powerful because it allows you to upload images you don't have to worry about you know setting up your own s3 bucket worry about um image optimizations how you're gonna like um efficiently serve images to people that are you know, all located all the on the other side of the globe. Given that you know, next image does help with some of that. Uh, culinary was still good when it comes to like serving as a CDN. So Eversell, we do use culinary for some of our marketing sites. So it's just a great way for you to create 
a CMS on the back end that you can, anytime you can upload, you can update your pictures, you can change crop, even edit pictures when mm -hmm. they're already being deployed, uh, when they've already been uploaded, you can edit them and keep the same URL, which is super cool. Um, so yeah, it's just a very seamless, powerful um, C like image CDN as a service uh, that I highly recommend people to just try out. And uh, if you're building an like, application, that needs people to upload features if you're not if you're not doing something that's like you know image specific and you need to build your own thing i always recommend you, you know, <laughs> a solution that's already yeah. out there i used to think to myself when i was building I, i'm so before joining myself i built up a ton of like different side projects this is a little bit of an anecdote here but i was there was once i was trying to build this affiliate management system for one of the side projects and i was like i was considering a few different options that are out there and I was like, hmm, I'm a developer. I'm going to build this myself. <laughs> so I wasted two months doing that. <laughs> I learned a ton about like e tags and like cookies and like what's uh Anyways, all those different stuff. I learned a ton about that. But eventually I realized there's this trade-off between build versus buy. So if you're planning, if you want to move fast and if you're a startup, highly recommend using existing tools that are already out there that are best in your class and just move as fast as possible. You can rebuild it eventually if you need. Yeah. Run skill as a company. It's up to you. But in the beginning, don't get too caught up with wanting to build everything yourself. No, yeah. I think it's I think it's great experience, especially early on, um, just to learn like what are the different things that this service does for me. Again, me going to all zero, like I could use the SDK, but understanding behind the scenes what all goes on is a is a pretty big learning experience. So there is usefulness there, but um, but most of the time for your app, like whatever your startup is, if unless it is specifically image something or unless it specifically is auth something or unless it's specifically database something, like use the things that are already doing that thing really well and focus on whatever it is that makes your application, your application to your users and customers. Like fo focus on the thing that um, that's actually special about it versus the things you just have to have. Those things you have to have have been done really well by these different services um, and they make it really easy for you to implement. So I'm 100% on board with that. Um, there's yeah. one other piece of Cloudinary I wanted to mention that I think is really cool. Um, so you can do these transformations in the URL. So you can say like, give me a version of this image with a width of 400 or a height of 400, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, and what Cloudinary will do is it'll actually generate that image the first time. So similar to like the ISG stuff we talked about earlier. And then after uh, that image is generated the first time, it caches it. So if you like put in a URL for a new version of that image and type it right into your browser, it'll take a second to get it. And then if you refresh, it's there instantly because that thing now has been cached across all these different uh, nodes of their CDN. Um, yes. So I thought that was really cool too, that how they handle um, the caching, not only to make it fast, but also for your like usage rate. Um, so it doesn't count as a hit against your usage after that thing has been cached, which is neat. That's incredible. That's the same uh, way that we do it as well. It's like we have a mm -hmm. bandwidth, we charge by bandwidth, we charge by service execution. And if you can, we're doing it with on demand SR, you basically cut down a lot on service mm -hmm. execution, which is usually what people go over on. Yeah. <laughs> because you're not regenerating a page every mm -hmm. every six seconds. You're only regenerating if there's a change in the database, which is super yep. cost efficient. Uh, and going back to your, your point about like uh, build versus buy and like how you should people have this bias that, oh, if I use these tools, would it scale? Like, would I be paying more down the road? But if they don't realize that there's so much value that goes under the hood, like for example, yourself, there's a lot of like edge caching and all these different technologies that we've perfected over a long period of time. And because we are serving so many customers, we can do it at scale. And uh, mm -hmm. there's this term called economies of scale. We are able to do it at a low cost. But if yep. you're doing, doing everything by yourself, first, you got to invest in like mm -hmm. a strong engineering team to do that. And second, maintenance and making sure that everything is up to date, all the node modules, it takes a long, a lot of money as well. So might as well pay someone who knows exactly mm -hmm. an expert, like for example, with planet scale, you guys are experts at databases. So instead of having to understand all this different underlying infrastructure that goes to powering your database, like your tests and stuff like that, sharding, you can just use planet scale. So mm -hmm. yeah, uh, that's a great takeaway. Yeah. I'll give, <laughs> I'll give my like quick anecdote as we wrap up. Um, I've been doing uh, woodworking. I've been really into like trying to build and make stuff myself, which is a lot of fun. It's also incredibly frustrating, just like learning anything else. I like relate it back to web development. Like so many people early on in their career 
they feel defeated. They feel imposter syndrome. They feel like they failed just because it's a hard thing to do. And I'm feeling a lot of that myself. And so in theory, like people have this idea like, hey, if I build it myself, it'll be a lot cheaper. But what what I didn't give enough thought to is like, what are the different tools for each project that I need to then be able to do the thing quicker, easier, better, more efficiently for myself? How much yeah. is my time worth, which my time becomes more and more valuable every day? Um, and then like, what is the final product to look like? Like I'm still, I'm st if I'm looking to get something cheap, I'm not going to be able to build something that looks as good as something that comes from Ikea for the same price. Like it's just not possible for me to do yeah. that. Um, that said, like, this is still something that I'm just, I'm going to continue to do it to build up my yeah. skills and get better at it. Uh, but it is, it is an interesting conversation when you really start looking at like, what are all the different resources that go into it? developer time is incredibly expensive so how much time from how many people would you need to build a thing to maintain it to pay attention to best practices security like making sure all that stuff is ready to go is yeah. um it's just not easy to do especially like you said early on when you have a small team even with bigger teams it's not an easy thing to do yeah totally um and that's why we have a lot of like strong big enterprise customers people like walmart and target that are not very technology focused like google maybe mm -hmm. sure, yep. but like People like these large companies that are retail giants, but they don't really have a huge like technology or engineering team. It makes sense for them to use something like Next.js and Rasel. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's a going back to your point about woodwork. I think you'll be fr really good friends with one of our, our I think our CRO. His name is Kevin KVG. Okay. He, he loves working as well. <laughs> this triangle is a black triangle, and mm -hmm. it's displayed in our uh, nice. Uh, our HQ at, at the WeWork uh, nice. California. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> you should talk to him. It's it's a it's an interesting. It's a, it's a it's a fun hobby to have. I don't. I personally like when it comes to hobbies. I haven't like. It's funny. Like I've been trying to get back into my hobbies more. Like I recently bought a piano. Uh, nice. Playing around with that, but but it's important. I, I, the point is that it's important to still do your hobbies uh, on top of whatever you're doing professionally. Mm -hmm. It's great for your mental health. Great for you know, you just relax and get inspiration for your day day job. So I don't yeah. know how that turned there, but <laughs> <laughs> now but now I, we're into like the self help and motivational part of the <laughs> of the stream. <laughs> Amazing. But yeah, I I am I talk about that a lot. I my wife and I have lots of hobbies, including we have a championship soccer game for one of the leagues that we're in tonight. So nice. we're excited about that one. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, well, cool. <laughs> I this has been super fun. Um, I just I love. I love where we've gone with getting creative with the technologies that we that we have. Like I think that's the kind of the epitome of like Jamstack and serverless and that kind of stuff. Like it's all just kind of taking stuff that we've had and now being more creative with how we use it and when we do what uh, to gain extra benefits. So I think this is kind of a culmination of a lot of that stuff. It's also well timed that there happened to be a release today that we could talk a little bit about too. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have. Do you want to? Do you have like a specific link we can send people to as we wrap up? Maybe just the like the landing page for the starter kit. Sure. Yeah. Um. I think the landing page for the starter kit is right here. Yeah, that's the one. And then there's also the release for Next.js 12 that people can check mm -hmm. out. Um. I think we already somewhere. Seen. There we go. Got it. Just the org slash 12. Yeah. We always have really really cool short links it's like nexus.org slash 12 oh yeah, cool know. okay um, but yeah that works um so yeah those are the two main ones feel free to yeah feel free to check it out and uh if you guys have any questions i'm happy to answer them you can ping me on twitter uh it's at steven tay i'm just plugging it shamelessly but <laughs> <laughs> if you guys have any questions i'm, I'm reachable there happy to answer happy to answer anything as you absolutely should that's what <laughs> Anytime you're a guest on another channel, that's an open invitation to uh, to plug away. I'm gonna throw your Twitter handle in there just so people have it. I appreciate um, it. Cool. Uh, well, yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Honestly, this has been amazing. Uh, really enjoyed chatting with you. You're an incredible host. Host love planet scale. Uh, and yeah, looking forward to doing more of these in the future. Cool. Yeah. Same here. Thank you for coming on. Thank you everyone for hanging out in the chat and listening in. And I have a feeling we'll have more to talk about behind the scenes with some of the integration pieces and demo stuff. So I'm excited for us to, to talk more. Um, in the meantime, thanks again, everyone, for hanging out. And we'll catch you next time.